I'd like to welcome all of you to the 2018, which is the 21st annual Katzenstein Distinguished Lecture in Physics. I am very uh, happy to introduce to you our provost, Dr. Jeremy Teitelbaum, who is also the Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs. He has been very supportive for the physics department in its growth, its well-being, but also he enabled the creation of our astronomy group, and for that we are very fortunate. So Jeremy would like to also extend to you his welcome. Thank you, Nora. Uh, welcome, everybody, to one of the high points of the intellectual calendar here at the University of Connecticut. Um, in my job recently, I have been to many meetings discussing how the university's um, applied work in engineering can make a significant difference in the economic future of the state of Connecticut. So it's a pleasure and a relief to me to come to a talk about something important, <laughs> namely the fundamental structure uh, of the universe. And I'm very much looking forward to the talk. We're very honored uh, to have our speaker here today. And um, I don't need to take up more of your time before the main event. So I'll turn the microphone back to Nora. Thank you. So the funding for this Endowed Distinguished Lecture Series is made possible by a very generous gift from Dr. Henry Katzenstein. And in addition to this Distinguished Lecture Series, he also endowed a prize for our undergraduate students. In fact, you would see the list of the student who won the prize in the last page of the program that you have. These generous gifts are very impactful to our students, but also to our academic vitality. So Henry was a very interesting person. He had a lot of different interests, and he pursued them with vigor and passion. And as such, he is a great role model for all of us. So Henry is seen over there. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about his life. Henry attended, <coughs> excuse me, Bird High School as an undergraduate at Duke University and served in the Navy, working on the development of radar during World War II. In 1951, he presented his military discharge paper to the University of Connecticut, together with a list of courses that he has taken at the University of Chicago and Duke. And within a year, he received his bachelor degree, and he was the first recipient of the PhD in 1954. He did a postdoc at MIT, began his career at Olympic Radio and TV in New York. Then he moved to California in 62 to become vice president of solid state radiation in West Los Angeles, and later became the president of Contract Corporation. So as you can see, a PhD in physics opened a lot of doors. Actually, a bachelor in physics also opens a lot of doors. So you don't necessarily have to be in academia like some of us, but you can, in fact, start your own company if you wish. He also holds a key pattern used for reading information from Compact Disc and co-founding Brutree Corporation. And in fact, we can see his pattern right there. So maybe we believe that the rural Connecticut made him want to, um, in fact, start another major change in his career because he moved to Rio Grande, California, where he built green heart farms and developed new methods for vegetable transplants. So his greenhouse provides a significant fraction of the vegetable seeding in California farms. Somehow he found the time to pursue his other interests like musing, playing recorder, and a wide assortment of medieval wind instrument. So today, we in the physics department are thrilled to host Professor Takaaki Kazita, according to the web, it says that that's how I should pronounce your name, Kazita, <laughs> from the University of Tokyo, and he is the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. And before I turn the mic to Philip Meinheim, who's going to be introducing him, I'd like first to thank all of those who made this event possible. Kerry from the office has done a huge amount, Philip Meinheim, of course, 
also, but also two of our graduate students who have taken pictures. You've seen Niraj taking pictures around in the reception and will be taking pictures now. And we have also Matthew Phelps who would be taking pictures during the dinner and the, the, the um, first entrees. So please help me thank everybody who made this event possible. It's both an honor and a privilege for me to welcome Professor Tak uh, Kajita here today to give the uh, Katzenstein Lecture. Um, he's not just a distinguished physicist, we've been getting to know him, and he's a very, very nice person and very, very pleasant, and we've had a, a wonderful time meeting with him and talking physics and talking in general with him. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about his background. Um, he got his bachelor's degree at Saitama University in Japan, and then he did his master's and his PhD at the University of Tokyo, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, he became an assistant professor at the university and then a professor uh, in 1999. He's the director of the Center for Cosmic Neutrinos at the Institute for Cosmic Ray Research at the university. He's a principal investigator at the Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe, and he has received uh, numerous uh, prizes. He's been awarded the Asahi Prize, the Bruno Rossi, Rossi Prize, a second Asahi Prize, the Nishina Prize, Memorial Prize, the Panofsky Prize, the Totsuka Award, Totsuka was one of his advisors, the Japan Academy Prize, the Julius Wess Award, the Fundamental Physics Prize, and of course, the Nobel Prize. Now, Professor Kajita did his PhD in the University of Tokyo under the direction of Professor Koshiba, and they were at what is called the Kamioka facility. It's a small place in Japan, and they were developing a, an apparatus called Cameo Canned. And this has been not just a prestige research center in Japan, it's been one of the major research centers worldwide. Um, Professor Koshiba was one of the first people to detect neutrinos from the sun and earned the Nobel Prize, along with Ray Davis, who detected it slightly different way. And then the question was, well, what are these neutrinos like? And Professor Kajita explored that, and they expanded uh, Cameo Canned to Super Cameo Canned, and they were able to resolve <coughs> perhaps one of the biggest open questions in physics since the 1930s, which is whether neutrinos have mass or don't have mass, and they were able to show definitively that they do have mass, and for this work, along with Professor MacDonald, who was producing, doing a similar experiment in uh, Sudbury in Canada, uh, they shared the Nobel Prize for this discovery. So we are particularly honored to have him here today, and let us welcome him to this uh, assembly. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Now, um, it's a, well, it's really an honor to, to give a Katzenstein Distinguished Lecture here at the University of Connecticut. Um, today, I'm going to talk about neutrino oscillations. And, well, here in this slide, you see um, some, well, something in the, <laughs> in the uh, well, background. This is the uh, super Kamiokande detector, and we have been studying neutrinos 
with this uh, detector. Well, this is the outline of this talk. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the, uh, well, this is the introduction, so neutrinos and atom fake neutrinos. Then I want to move on to our work, that is the uh, atom fake neutrino deficit, discovery of neutrino oscillations. Then I want to briefly discuss the dis discovery of solar neutrino oscillations. And after that, I want to discuss the status of neutrino oscillation studies and the importance of neutrino mass. And I'd like to emphasize that the studies of neutrino oscillations are not finished yet. So I want to talk about the future neutrino oscillation experiments and I will summarize. <coughs> now, I want to talk about the uh, neutrinos and atom fake neutrinos. But, well, okay, maybe it's just straightforward, but anyway, well, I summarized the key features of neutrinos here. Uh, neutrinos are uh, fundamental particles like electrons and quarks. Uh, neutrinos are something like electrons without electric charge. And in fact, this feature is very important because, well, for example, electrons are well, traveling, um, well, how to say, <coughs> Neut well, okay, Neutro uh, electrons and nucleus um, attract each other due to the electro electromagnetic force, but, well, neutrinos have no electric charge. Therefore, even if neutrinos come close to the uh, nucleus, they don't neutrinos don't feel the existence of nucleus. Therefore, neutrinos can easily penetrate um, through the atom. And in fact, as I write here, uh, neutrinos can easily pass through even the earth. Uh, but well, fortunately, neutrinos can sometimes interact with matter. And therefore, we have ways to study neutrinos by detecting very rare neutrino interactions. <coughs> now, I have one more page. Um, well, neutrinos, like other particles, have three types or three flavors, namely electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos. But anyway, well, the name is not important. Please re just remember that there are three types of neutrinos. And in a very successful standard model of particle physics, neutrinos are assumed to have no mass. But, well, physicists have been asking neutrinos have really no mass. So this is the background to our work. <coughs> and well, these neutrinos we have been studying in our detector were produced by cosmic ray interactions in the atom sphere. Well, as you know, cosmic ray particles enter into the atom sphere. And if they come into the atom sphere, they interact with the air nucleus. And typically, uh, pions are produced. But pions are unstable. Therefore, they decay to muons, then muons decay to electrons. And during this decay chain, two muon neutrinos and one electron neutrino are produced. And 
they come to the uh, detector and sometimes interact in within the detector. And we have been studying these neutrinos for many years. <coughs> and before discussing the details of the experiment, I want to tell you the key features of these neutrinos produced in the atmosphere. First of all, I said that two muon neutrinos and one electron neutrino are produced by a decay chain of pi on. And in fact, this has an important feature. If we calculate the muon neutrino over electron neutrino flux ratio, we know that the flux ratio is almost exactly two in the low energy re region. If we go to higher energy region, the flux ratio changes, but well, this is and controlled by an easy physics. Therefore, the flux ratio can be calculated very accurately. And another important feature is summarized here. Um, this is the uh, neutrino direction. So cosine theta one means downgoing neutrinos, neutrinos coming from above, and minus one means upward going neutrinos, neutrinos coming from the other side of the earth. And if, well, this is the lowest energy, high, a little bit higher energy, and this is high energy neutrinos, and you can easily see that the predicted flux of neutrinos for downgoing and upward going are essentially the same. And in fact, if we do a very good, a very, uh, very accurate calculation, we can calculate the up-down flux ratio to an accuracy of typically 1% or so. <coughs> and well, these features play a very important role in the discovery of neutrino oscillations. Now, okay, now I want to move on to the experiment. Well, more than 50 years ago, we already knew that atmospheric neutrinos should exist. Therefore, again, more than 50 years ago, people carried out the first atmospheric neutrino experiments. And in these experiments, in fact, atmospheric neutrinos were observed. And well, this one was carried out in South Africa, and this one was carried out in India. And both of these experiments were carried out in an extremely deep place. For example, this experiment was carried out at the, say, depth of about three kilometers from the surface. And anyway, these experiments observed atmospheric neutrinos for the first time. Now, it was very good that these experiments observed atmospheric neutrinos. However, I would say that after this discovery, the people's interest in atmospheric neutrinos were not so strong. So for while people did not pay much attention to atmospheric neutrinos. Now, I want to move on to our experiments. The <coughs> history of our experiment um, began about 40 years ago. In the 70s, um, there were proposals of 
new theories that was grand unified theories of uh, strong weak and uh, electromagnetic forces. And these new theories at that time predicted that protons should decay with the lifetime of about 10 to 30 years. That means if we observe protons decay, that means strong and strong weak and electromagnetic forces should be unified at a high energy scale. Well, so we thought that this is a very important prediction. Therefore, we should observe proton decays. And in fact, in the early 80s, um, there were five experiments trying to observe proton decay. Um, these photos show these five experiments. Well, unfortunately, these, are, these experiments didn't observe proton decay. Instead, these experiments observed many contained atom thick neutrino interactions. They were the background for proton decay signals. <coughs> and one of them was the Kamiokande experiment. Now, I'm, 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 I'm going to talk about the Kamiokande experiment. Uh, first of all, you, you may not know the location of the experiment. Well, this is the map of Japan, and the location of the experiment was there. So you expect that the experiment was in the mountain area? And yes, you are right. Well, OK, this photo was actually a little bit more recent one. But anyway, this is the area the Kamio Kandu was um, operated. Well, in the left, there is a mountain. And inside the mountain, there was Kamio Kandu experiment. So, well, of course, we, we had to construct the uh, Kamiokande detector. Therefore, in the spring of 1983, we worked in underground to construct the Kamiokande detector. And this photo was taken in the spring, one day in the spring of 1983. At, on that day, these people come into the mine. Well, actually, I said underground, but in fact, the Kamiokande was constructed in, in an active mine. So well, this photo was taken in the morning of 1983, and these people enter into the mine, mine by a train, mine train. And typically, we enter into the mine at the, at the, at the train of 7.10 in the morning. And we worked in the mine. And we go out from the mine by a train of at 4.18 or 5.18. And if we have some trouble, we have to stay longer. And the next train is 10.48. Anyway, we worked that way. <laughs> and now, if we go into the mine, then we worked this way. Well, Kamiokande was actually a large water tank. Um, it had an about 16 meter in diameter and 16 meter in height. And it contained about 3,000 tons of water. And we had to install the photo detectors onto the detector wall, tank wall. And therefore, one of the major uh, tasks we had to do was to install the photo detectors onto the tank. And for this, uh, we decided to use rubber boards, 
why? Well, I said tank is 60 meter high, and if well, we do not have water, and if we work at the 60 meter high, maybe we drop. Then, well, it, it's a trouble. <laughs> so we decided to use rubber boats. Anyway, so we worked that way for several months in underground, in the mine, and we, we began the experiment on July 6, 1983. Unfortunately, as I said, we were unable to observe proton decays. Instead, we observed atmospheric neutrino interactions. So, well, in the first few years, we simply searched for proton decays, but no signal. And after some years, we have to seriously think to separate proton decay signal and the atmospheric neutrino background more seriously. Therefore, in 1986, we decided to improve the data analysis software. We developed new software to improve the proton decay searches. And one of them was a new software to identify the particle type for a Cherenkov ring. Well, this is a typical muon neutrino interaction observed in Kamiokande. Well, this is a muon neutrino interaction, but in addition, we have an electron neutrino interaction. So we, we wanted to separate muon neutrino interaction and the electron neutrino interaction. And we, therefore, we developed a new software. And of course, if we developed a new, we, if we developed a new software, we have to test the new software extensively. Therefore, as a test, the neutrino flavor was studied for the atmospheric neutrino events observed so far in Kamiokande. Then it was found that the number of muon neutrino events was much fewer than expected. So this observation was totally unexpected. Anyway, since we were at the stage of testing the new software, this was suggesting that the new software is something wrong, something strange, something bad. <laughs> anyway, um, we thought that it's likely that there was some mistakes somewhere in the data analysis, or maybe somewhere in the data reduction or somewhere else. So we started the uh, various studies to find mistakes in this software package. That was the um, fall of 1986. <coughs> we worked hard, but even after one year of studies, we were unable to find any serious mistake in the data analysis software package. So we concluded that the muon neutrino deficit cannot be due to any major problem in the data analysis nor the simulation. So we decided to um, publish our data. Simply, we tried to report what we observed and the um, basic result is summarized here. We simply reported the number of muon neutrino events observed in Kamiokande. That was 85. Oh, we also um, reported the number of expected muon neutrino interactions. That was 144. We did the same thing for electron neutrinos. We observed 93 while the expected number was 88 or 89. So, <coughs> we 
we just reported. And at the end of the paper, we concluded that we are unable to explain the data as the result of the systematic detector effects or uncertainties in the atmospheric neutrino flux, some as yet unaccounted for physics, such as neutrino oscillations, might explain the data. That was our conclusion. So at this stage, um, we simply reported that there is a deficit of muon neutrino interactions. However, at that stage, we were unable to tell the reason for the deficit. <coughs> anyway, at the end, we commented on the possible possibility of neutrino oscillations. Now, let me briefly talk about the neutrino oscillations. Um, in fact, neutrino oscillation was predicted more than 50 years ago. These are the people who studied neutrino oscillations theoretically. They were Maki, Nakagawa, Sakata, and Ponte Corvo. <laughs> and according to them, if neutrinos have mass, neutrinos change their type or flavor from one type to the other. For example, as I show here, um, muon neutrinos produced at this point while propagating in the vacuum changes the probability of muon neutrino to remain muon neutrino. So at this point, this probability is very low, but if they propagate further, the, this probability come back to unity. If they propagate further, this probability go back, go up, go down. And when mu neutrino disappeared, tau neutrino is appearing. So this is the neutrino oscillation theory. So theoretically, we knew this could happen. Therefore, neutrino oscillation was considered as a possible explanation of the atmospheric neutrino deficit. Um, anyway, um, our first paper was published in 1988. However, uh, in the first few years, there were no other support from the other experiments. Therefore, people were very skeptical about this result. And well, we we had an um, similar result only in 1991 from the another large water Cherenkov experiment that was the IMB experiment. <laughs> and this experiment also reported the deficit of mu neutrino events. And here I summarized the data from these two experiments, Kamiokande and IMB. And the horizontal axis shows the number of muon events over electron events of the data divided by the same ratio of the Monte Carlo prediction. And you can see uh, the mu over E ratio is much smaller than the predicted number for both experiments. So at that stage, people began to seriously take the data from Kamiokande and IMB experiments. However, even at that stage, we were unable to tell the reason for the deficit. Now, we would like to really separate the neutrino oscillation and other hypotheses. And we thought this way. Well, neutrinos are produced by cosmic ray interactions in the atmosphere. Therefore, neutrinos are produced everywhere in the atmosphere. And some of them are produced just above us. 
say, maybe 10, 20 kilometers above us. And they come to the detector immediately after the production. They only travel 10 to 20 kilometers. So they may have no time to oscillate. Now, neutrinos are produced, also produced in the other side of the Earth. They have to travel long distances before coming to the detector. Typically, they have to travel 10,000 kilometers. So they may have long time to oscillate. Therefore, if neutrino, os neutrino oscillations are the reasons, reason for the deficit of muon neutrinos, then we should observe the up-down asymmetry of the neutrino interactions. <coughs> However, in order to study this effect, 3,000 ton Kamiokande detector was too small. So we needed much larger detector. That was Super Kamiokande. Now I, I want to move on to the discovery of neutrino oscillations. <laughs> the detector that discovered neutrino oscillation is the Super Kamiokande detector. It is a kind of much larger version of the original Kamiokande detector. Um, well, it is a Super Kamiokande is a 50,000 ton water Cherenkov detector. Um, it's about, it has about 40 meter in diameter and 40 meter in height. Um, by the way, it is an international collaboration. We have about 160 people from 10 countries. <coughs> oh, by the way, in this occasion, I want to tell you about the history of the Super Kamiokande experiment. <coughs> the initial idea of Super Kamiokande was um, reported in 1983. 1983 was the year that Kamiokande began the experiment. In the fall of 1983, Professor Koshiba recognized that maybe in Kamiokande, solar neutrinos can be detected. Yes, but he also recognized that the solar neutrino event rate to be observed in Kamiokande is so low, maybe say one event in a, year, in, a, in a week. Therefore, even though Kamiokande could observe solar neutrinos, uh, it, it, it's not possible to study details of solar neutrinos. Therefore, he proposed a much larger detector to study solar neutrinos in detail. That was the Super Kamiokande detector. Um, this is the copy of the, of the proceedings of, of a workshop in KEK in 1983. Uh, at that workshop, he proposed the initial idea of Super Kamiokande. Uh, by the way, this is, was really the 1983 uh, image, and well, you, you cannot read, but here it says that the fiducial volume should be 22 kilotons. And late, later year, we realized the super kamiokande, and the fiducial volume of the real super kamiokande is 22.5 kilotons. So basically, we stick to the initial idea that was proposed in 1983. <clears throat> okay, that was the initial proposal. And well, it took us almost 10 years. And the Super Kamiokande was approved in 1991. 
Then, in the next year, we had the first serious meeting with our US colleagues. <laughs> and this photo was taken in 1992 at our institute, Institute for Cosmic Ray Research. And in that meeting, we seriously discussed the responsibilities of the Japan team and the US team. Oh, by the way, the US team was um, based on the IMB experiment. That was the another large water Cherenkov detector in the United States. So, uh, well, I think it was fortunate for us to have the US colleagues from the beginning of the experiment. <coughs> anyway, um, the Super Kamiokande experiment began as an international collaboration from the beginning. And well, while we are talking about the collaboration, the on-site work was going on. And in 1994, the underground cavity to install the super Kamiokande detector was ready. So this was a photo, this was this is the photo taken in 1994 when the excavation was finished. And in fact, from the bottom of the uh, cavity to the top, uh, there is 58 meters. So this is really a big cavity. And after that, um, the uh, detector tank was constructed. Then after that, physicists worked in underground to install the photo detectors onto the detector. And this photo was taken in the spring of 1995 when we installed the photo detectors onto the tank. And well, Super Kamiokande is, in fact, much larger than Kamiokande experiment. Therefore, we needed much larger number of people to install the photo detectors onto the, dete onto the wall, onto the tank. So typically, these people, this number of people worked in underground every day, essentially for a year, to make the Super Kamiokande detector. And here you can see Professor Totsuka, who was the first spokesperson of the Super Kamiokande experiment. By the way, you may notice there, there, is, there are photo tubes there. Actually, these photo tubes are the photo tubes for the roof. In fact, we constructed the roof part of the detector at the bottom of the tank. After making the roof part, all the structure was raised 40 meter. And in fact, although in Kamiokande, we used boats to install the pho photo detectors onto the onto the wall, but we realized that that is not a good idea to install the photo detectors to the super Kamiokande tank. So we decided to do all the work at the floor. So this photo was taken when we were making the uh, um, wall of the super Kamiokande detector. So every day, uh, we constructed each tower. So we installed the uh, module here, and then the whole tower was raised by two meters and put another uh, module here and raised. This way, we constructed the whole wall structure from the bottom. That way, we avoided the boat. Unfortunately, later, <laughs> we noticed uh, the uh, phot photo detectors were, mm, were covered by dust, mine dust. 
So after finishing the construction, we decided to clean up all the photo tubes using the boat. <laughs> so in the end, we had to use boat. Anyway, well, this photo was taken in January 96, and we began the experiment on April 1st, 96. Um, well, since the Super Kamiokande experiment is the second generation experiment, therefore we were able to use um, the uh, software package that was developed in the Kamiokande and IMB experiments. However, I have to say that in the Kamiokande era, we were unable to fully automate the analysis. In Kamiokande, well, by the way, this is a typical two Cherenkov ring event. You can see a ring here and also here. Uh, in, in the Kamiokande era, we are unable to develop a software to tell the number of Cherenkov rings. But, well, if, and, and in Kamiokande era, we, we scan each event. But in Super Kamiokande, the event rate is so high, of course, we have to, if, if we scan the real event, then we have to scan the Monte Carlo simulation event. That is not possible. Therefore, we decided to seriously improve the software. And in fact, in Super Kamiokande, we are able to develop a new software to tell the number of Cherenkov rings. And that was made possible by the Hoff transformation and plus maximum likelihood. So by this development, we are able to fully automate the analysis. That was really very important for the success of the Super Kamiokande experiment. And well, the, since it, it is a second generation experiment, the detector itself worked quite well from the beginning. And from the beginning of the experiment, we were able to observe these neutrino interactions. These, this is a typical single ring muon neutrino event. This is a typical single ring electron neutrino event. And this is a so-called partially contained event. That is, neutrino interaction occurred inside the tank but the muon produced by the neutrino interaction penetrate through the detector. And this is also a neutrino interaction. This is a high energy muon neutrino interaction occurring below the super Kamiokande detector. Then a muon produced by the neutrino interaction enter into the detector from the bottom then propagate to the top and existed from the top of the detector. So all these are neutrino interactions and all these are used in the data analysis. And well, I, I want to say one more thing. Well, since the event patterns are quite different among these uh, event categories, therefore we had to um, make a team to um, analyze each category, category of events. And well, we worked quite well as a team. And in two years, we were able to report the first important result. And that, that was presented at the Neutrino Conference in 98. <coughs> and this is one of the copies of the presentation at the conference. Here, uh, in this plot, we show the Dean-Sang distribution of muon neutrino event and electron neutrino event. And the definition is cosine theta one means downgoing neutrinos, and minus one means upward going neutrinos, neutrinos coming from the other side of the Earth. And plus it shows the data, and the boxes shows the Monte Carlo prediction. And you can see for downgoing neutrinos, 
the data and the prediction agrees quite well. However, for the upward going neutrinos coming from the other side of the Earth, data points are much lower than the predicted uh, rate. In fact, data are almost a factor of two lower than expected. And this is, in fact, the effect expected for neutrino oscillations. And well, statistically, it was quite significant. Therefore, basically from this um, plot, we were able to convince that neutrinos to oscillate. And this is the um, summary of the presentation. Um, well, this is a, a bit detailed, but um, this is the neutrino oscillation parameter fit. Uh, this is the delta M square, that is the neutrino mass, and this is the essentially the neutrino mixing. So all the different category of data set pointed a single oscillation parameter and therefore, Super Kamiokande concluded that the observed Jin Sang dependent deficit and the other supporting data gave evidence for neutrino oscillations. Oh, by the way, this was 20 years ago. So, this um, copy of slide tells us the technology development where 20 years ago, we used this kind of plastic <laughs> to present our result. <coughs> um, well, anyway, that was our presentation. Then, fortunately, on the next day, um, there was um, President Clinton's talk at MIT. Uh, well, this was a um, talk at the uh, MIT commencement, and it's a long talk, but in the middle of the talk, um, he mentioned that this way, just yesterday in Japan, physicists announced a discovery that tiny neutrinos have mass. Now, they may not mean much to most Americans, but it may change our most fundamental theories from the nature of the smallest subatomic particles to how the universe itself works and indeed how it expands. Well, I think the Super Kamiokande collaboration were honored by the remark by President Clinton 20 years ago. Well, if the discovery is now, I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, I want to move on. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, I described our discovery of neutrino oscillations, but there, there was another discovery of neutrino oscillations that was the discovery of solar neutrino oscillations. Therefore, I want to briefly discuss this discovery. The history of the solar neutrino measurement began about half a century ago. And this is the first solar neutrino experiment that was carried out in Homestake. And this Homestake solar neutrino experiment observed solar neutrinos for the first time. And for this uh, achievement, um, Ray Davis Jr received the uh, Nobel Prize in 2002. However, if they compare the predicted flux by John Bacall and their measurement, there was a factor of three discrepancy. The observed event rate was only about one third of the prediction. This was the uh, solar neutrino problem. And this was about 50 years ago. Uh, by the way, solar neutrino experiments are very difficult experiments. 
therefore, in the 70s and even 80s, people are always worried about the um, difficulty of the experiment. That means people did not completely believe the uh, um, observed flux. Therefore, it was necessary to carry out um, independent experiments. And in fact, um, before year 2000, there were five experiments that measured solar neutrino flux. And this is a summary of the measurement as a function of the threshold neutrino energy. Here is one MeV. And this is the Ray Davis experiment. In addition, there were four experiments. Oh, by the way, there are two experiments summarized here. And well, if the observed event, event rate is consistent with, with the theory, then the experiment should be around here. So it's clear that all these experiments observe the deficit of solar neutrinos. However, these experiments were unable to tell the reason for the deficit. And then the snow detector was constructed in Canada. It is located two kilometers from the surface, and it is a 1,000 ton heavy water detector. And using heavy water, the snow experiment can carry out a very unique measurement. That is, um, snow can measure the total neutrino flux independent of the neutrino type or neutrino flavor. And in fact, if they measure the total neutrino flux, the result was just consistent with the theoretical prediction. However, if they observe only electron neutrinos, then the event rate was only one third of the prediction. So this was the clear evidence that solar neutrinos change their type somewhere between the center of the sun and the earth. And based on this uh, measurement, uh, Art McDonald received the Nobel Prize in Physics. <coughs> now, well, this was the most important discovery in solar neutrinos, solar neutrino oscillations. But in my opinion, there's another important experiment that contributed to our understanding of solar neutrino oscillations. That is the Kamland experiment carried out in Japan. In fact, uh, this was not the solar neutrino experiment. This experiment observed neutrinos produced by, uh, produced by nuclear power stations. Um, so this is the map of Japan, and also shown uh, the location of the nuclear power stations. And here is Kamran, and you can see at the distance of about 180 kilometers, there are a lot of po nuclear power stations, and Kamran observed neutrinos from that distance. And if they plot the um, observed over predicted event rate as a function of L over E, then they observe this kind of sinusoidal behavior, which is just predicted by neutrino oscillations. So with this data, we were really convinced that the solar neutrino deficit was due to neutrino oscillations. <laughs> anyway, uh, that was the um, discovery of the second neutrino oscillations. Now, I, I want to move on to the status of neutrino oscillation studies and the importance of neutrino mass. Um, well, we believe, 
uh, later I, I'll come to the uh, physics, well, possible physics implications, but we believe neutrino masses are very important. Therefore, since the discovery of neutrino oscillations, there have been many experiments trying to improve our knowledge by studying neutrino oscillations. And this is the list of the experiments that contributed to the new mu new tau oscillation studies. Um, well, of course, we used the uh, neutrinos produced by cosmic ray interactions, and these are the experiments that study these neutrinos. In addition, um, we have accelerator-based long baseline neutrino oscillation experiments. Uh, neutrinos are produced by um, by a collision of the uh, proton beam produced by accelerators, then neutrinos are produced, and then the um, these neutrinos are detected at the far distance. And this is the list of the experiments that contributed to the oscillation studies. So I just want to tell you that the physics community is really excited and we really have a lot of work going on in neutrinos. And well, uh, just as an example, I, I want to mention our recent study. Well, so far, the evidence for neutrino oscillation came from the disappearance of muon neutrinos. But if the disappearance of muon neutrinos are due to neutrino oscillations, then tau neutrinos should be appearing. Therefore, after the discovery of neutrino oscillations, Super Kamiokande has been searching for evidence for tau neutrino interactions. Now, if new tau is appearing by neutrino oscillations, then new tau could interact and produce tau. However, tau is an unstable particle, soon decay to other particles. So the final state of the new tau interaction contains a lot of particles. And the typical new tau event should look like this. This is a Monte Carlo simulation of a new tau event. But as expected, there are lots of Cherenkov rings in an event. And this suggests to us that it's not possible for super Kamiokande to identify new tau event by an event by event basis. Therefore, in super Kamiokande, we decided to do a statistical analysis knowing that new tau's are upward going only. Upward going only because they are produced by neutrino oscillations. <laughs> and therefore, Super Kamiokande carried out a dedicated um, study to find out a new tau signal. And this is the most updated result. Again, this is the events are shown as a function of Zin Sangu. And as expected, uh, there is a new tau component here in, in, in red. And statistically, it's already 4.6 sigma level. And we, we are essentially able to say that we have observed new tau appearance statistically. And this is, in fact, consistent with the dedicated new tau appearance experiment opera. Now, since there are three neutrino flavors, there should be uh, three different oscillation channels. Therefore, in the physics com neutrino community, after the discovery of solar neutrino oscillations, the major um, target was the discovery of the third oscillation channel. And in fact, about seven years ago, 
the third oscillation channel was discovered by these experiments. Uh, um, these are the long baseline neutrino oscillation experiments, and also these are the short baseline reactor neutrino oscillation experiments. And these experiments clearly observed the signal of third neutrino oscillation channel. So at this stage, we can say that the basic structure for three flavor neutrino oscillation has been understood. OK, that is the status. However, so far, I have not discussed why we think the neutrino masses are important. OK, well, in the next slide, I want to tell you what we think. Um, this, is, this plot shows the masses of quarks and charged leptons. There are six quarks and three charged leptons. Now, after the discovery of neutrino oscillations, there have been a lot of work related to the neutrino mass. Therefore, at, at this stage, I think it's, it's almost OK to say about the neutrino mass itself. So we try to overlay the neutrino uh, we would like to plot the neutrino mass on this plot. And they are here. So, well, first of all, neutrino, we notice not that neutrino masses are much smaller. But a little bit careful. So this one unit is 100. That means if there is, say, three unit difference, that is one million. And if we read, we easily notice that neutrino masses are approximately, or maybe even more than, 10 orders of magnitude smaller than the corresponding masses of quarks and charged leptons. 10 orders of magnitude smaller. That is the, that is important. And we believe that this is the key to better understand elementary particles and the universe. <coughs> now, so therefore, the physics community is excited with the neutrino mass. Now, before finishing this talk, I want to talk about the future of neutrino oscillation experiments. Well, I said that we essentially understood the neutrino oscillations. However, we do not know completely. We do not know everything yet. Um, for example, we do not know if the so-called heavy, heavy, well, heaviest mass state, third mass state is the indeed heaviest or even or, or the lightest. We do not know which is the truth. Uh, new three third mass state is the heaviest or the lightest. We do not know. We do not know if the oscillation probability is same for neutrinos and the antineutrinos. In fact, this is a very important question. If there is a difference, this may be the first hint towards toward our understanding of the baryon asymmetry of the universe. That means why the present universe contains matter, but no matter. No antimatter, sorry. In addition, um, we, we are not completely sure about the absolute neutrino mass. We are not sure if there is a, uh, any structure beyond the standard, standard three flavor framework. And finally, we do not know if neutrinos are Majorana particles. So these are the main agenda for the future neutrino experiments. But since the time is limited, I just concentrate on this um, part, that is the 
CP violation. So we really want to observe if oscillation probability of neutrinos and that of anti-neutrinos are identical or not. So in the physics or neutrino community, people are seriously thinking about this, this measurement. <coughs> However, it, it's, it's not an easy experiment. We definitely need the next generation long baseline experiments with much better performance neutrino detectors. And there are two projects. One is going on. This is the LBNF Dune uh, project. Neutrinos are produced at FameLab and detected at the uh, Homestake mine. <coughs> Another project, which is not approved yet, is the, uh, um, is the this one. Neutrinos are produced by JPAC and to be detected in a new super, uh, no, hyper Kamiokande detector. So we, we need this kind of um, very big project to observe the um, CP violation in neutrino sector. And well, since I have been involved in, in the experiment in Kamioka, and I'd like to briefly talk about this possible new detector. It's going to be a very large detector. The diameter should be around 74 meters and height should be around 60 meters. And the, the total and fiducial volume masses are 0.26 and 0.19 megatons, respectively. And this detector will be used to study neutrino oscillations, photon decays, supernova neutrinos, plus supernova neutrinos. And well, as I said, this project is not approved yet, but Hyper-K has been selected as one of the seven large scientific projects in the roadmap of the Japanese Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology. And well, since we are listed up as, uh, as one of the roadmap projects, therefore we are waiting for the project approval. Okay, so that's all. Let me summarize. Um, proton decay experiments in the 80s observed many contained atom spec neutrino events and discovered the atom spec muon neutrino deficit unexpectedly. Then about 10 years later, Super Kamiokande discovered neutrino oscillations, which shows that neutrinos have mass. And subsequently, solar neutrino oscillation was also discovered. And since then, various studies have been going on. And the discovery of neutrino oscillation, and no, no, non-zero neutrino mass opened a window to study physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. And neutrinos with small mass might also be the key to understand the fundamental questions of the universe. So, please stay tuned. <laughs> That's all. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, yes. Well, okay, yes, uh, we can observe these events, but 
unfortunately, the information we can get from these events are limited, as you expect. However, since the um, neutrino flux is calculated rather well, therefore, by observing these upward going muon neutrino upward going muon events, we can estimate the energy distribution of the parent neutrinos. Therefore, statistically, we can get some information on the neutrino oscillation parameters, such as neutrino mass. That way, we, use, we can use these neutrinos. Well, okay, uh -huh. still we can get some information on neutrino mass and neutrino mixings from these kind data. Very good question. In fact, um, of course, while propagating, even though neutrino type changes, the neutrino mass does not change. This is the first order answer. The, the trick is as follows. Well, when we say muon neutrinos, actually, the muon neutrino is a superposition of the three mass states, nu1, nu2, nu3. So the nu1, nu2, nu3 propagate coherently. Then, well, this state co coherently propagate, but since the masses of nu1, nu2, and nu3 are different, therefore the wavelengths are different slightly among them. Therefore, after some point, there is a phase mismatch between these three states. And that means, after some point, the state, the mu, this neutrino state cannot be identical with the initial state. That is the neutrino oscillation. Well, that standard model is formulated that way. Thank you. However, experimentally, um, cylindrical shape is much easier to construct. <laughs> also, well, even after the construction of the detector, you have to always monitor the detector itself. And for this, we sometimes install, say, light sources into the detector and so on. But for this, actually, the cylindrical detector is much easier. So experimentally, we selected cylindrical detector. I think the uh, contribution of the neutrino mass to the total uh, mass of the universe is very small. I don't remember the exact number, but well, 0.1% or so. It's not heavy. Yeah. 
yes, there are some data suggesting the existence of stellar neutrinos. Uh, well, these data exist, exi have been existing for more than, say, 20 years. But, in my opinion, statistical significance is not improving over the 20 years of studies, additional experiments. So I am still skeptical about this possibility. No, no, no. Uh, well, okay. We, s we, we, we needed to study these neutrinos because these are the backgrounds for proton decay. <laughs> that, that, that is the reason we seriously began to study atom thick neutrinos. <laughs> no more than that. <laughs> I see. Well, okay. We think this way, and certainly, Higgs particle is said to to be the source of the mass for all the particles. However, as I showed, the neutrino mass masses are too small, ten, more than ten orders of magnitude smaller than the corresponding masses of quarks and charged particles. Ten orders of magnitude is um problem. And we think that we, we need different mechanism, mechanism to produce neutri small neutrino mass. Well, in the present world, certainly neutrinos have always mass. Your question is, why do we want to observe CP variation in neutrinos? What? Why neutrinos are so weakly interacting with matter? Or, sorry. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Why the CP variation could, could tell us about the source of the baryon asymmetry of the universe? Yeah, well, okay. Um, we think this way. Um, <coughs> probably, in order to generate extremely small neutrino mass, we need um, very heavy neutrino-like particles right-handed neutrino. Then this extremely heavy particle should have existed during Big Bang. And if there is CP vibration, then this um, extremely heavy particle 
when they decay, they produce some asymmetry between matter and antimatter. And after some process, when the universe cooled down, the baryon could remain. This is the sto story we are think people are thinking. I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a um, significant, significant difference. Um, neutrinos created in the atmosphere are typically much higher energy compared with the solar neutrinos. Therefore, basically, we can separate solar neutrinos and atmospheric neutrinos by uh, making a cut in the energy. Thank you very much.